this is building a legal data service with Clojure. Um, I'm Jonathan Boston. This is Caleb Phillips. <coughs> and we work for a company called Cicada. We've been in business about four years, and we write software in the e-discovery space. Um, so we're going to talk about our um, experience with Clojure in that. And so e-discovery um, is basically the um, process of exchanging information in any type of legal case, um, exchanging evidence even. So um, an e-discovery is the electronic version of that, same as email. All right, so let's say company A and company B are involved in some type of, type of legal dispute. So company A has an obligation to, um, let's say, um, company B says, you infringed on our patent and we can prove it if you take all the um, emails and documents that your um, engineers have written over the past three years, right? And if you give us those, we can prove you've infringed our patent. So company A will collect all the relevant documents and then hand them off to their lawyers. And the lawyers are gonna filter those, right? Say, um, social security numbers, personal home addresses, things like that, um, that aren't relevant to the case, they'll redact those. Um, anything that's like attorney-client privilege, um, I don't have to send that to you, I'm not legally obligated, so we won't send those. Um, this is our, our secret sauce, this is how we make our thing, and so we're not legally obligated to hand you over all of our trade secrets, right? So they'll filter those documents and then produce those documents, it's called a production, and they will hand that production over to the other side, right? Saying, here's the evidence you requested, we're giving it to you. So company B will take that production and import it to whatever system, whatever software they're using, and then their lawyers will go through and search through all those documents. Right, and what they're searching for is what is called the hot document, the smoking gun that proves the case, proves what we have um, stated in the court. All right, so a few difficulties with this. Um, the documents that they're collecting, that can be anything from a tiny email to a spreadsheet with millions of rows to an access database, right, anything electronic. Um, and then you can have a few documents or you can have millions of documents. Right, so you have these small documents, huge documents, and potentially a large set, right? And then, um, not only, you're not, sometimes you're trying to find a single document out of those millions of documents, and sometimes you're trying to find a few or a group of documents that you use to piece together a story that proves your case. Um, so a lot of times it's not just this guy knew this, but if you see this guy talk to this lady, and this lady talk to this lady, and talk to this guy, see, you can see the chain, right? So you're trying to build this case. And this all needs to be fast because you have very expensive people involved in this. So any, you know, if you're going to millions of documents and you have a few seconds on each of those documents that slows you down, that ends up to be a significant amount of money. Um, and so our staff, we use Clojure on the back end, Clojure Script on the front end, um, Datomic as our main data store, main database, Elasticsearch um, for fast search, and then AWS we use heavily. Um, so for this, we're gonna talk, um, Caleb is gonna talk about our back end and Clojure, um, some experience with that. I'll talk about our front end with Clojure Script, and then we'll kind of end with some lessons learned. And our goal with this is to be transparent, is to show what is it really like. Um, so those things that, kind of seem embarrassing because, oh, we should have known that. We're going to talk about those um, and hopefully say these things we feel like we got right or at least got better with. So with that, I'll hand it off to Caleb. All right. Like Boston said, I'm Caleb Phillips, and I'm going to talk about uh, the back end kind of side of things, our data pipeline. And I'm calling this section designing with constraints and uh, kind of take you through how we've learned uh, to apply some of these things. Um, a quick overview of this section. I'm gonna talk about a couple propositions I'm gonna make, uh, how we did stuff wrong, how we're getting better at that, and then a little discussion about how we can maybe do that getting better earlier in the process. Uh, so to continue the Lego theme from this morning, uh, my first proposition is that the goal of software design is to allow you to focus on the task that you're working on. You're building a feature for your customer, and so any design that we do is to reduce the set of decisions that you have to make and keep your thinking space to that particular problem. Uh, what you don't want to do when you're building your Lego house is to have to drop down to the Lego factory and figure out uh, how you make a red Lego brick, or how long you have to cook it to make it the right consistency, and those kind of things, right? So a corollary to the, the first proposition is that missing design is distracting, right? When we don't have the right Lego pieces, 
uh, we as developers have to kind of go over the same de decisions again and again. And we get distracted and we're, you know, it's, it's more stressful because, you know, I don't know if you've ever been in that place where you think, hasn't somebody already figured this out for me? Uh, why are we coming across this ground again? Uh, and part of the problem is that compared to just banging out code on the keyboard, coming up with abstractions, doing upfront design is more of a soft skill, right? It's a little more intimidating. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever been a part of an effort where you've inherited some big upfront design that doesn't match the problem that you're dealing with at all, and then you have to live with that. Not only that you don't have what you need, but you have to support the bugs of this other thing. So uh, we're always looking for ways. How can we design better without wasting time? So my second proposition is that uh, considering limitations, the constraints that your software is going to face when you deploy it is a concrete way to go searching for abstractions. Am I ringing? Um, so it gives us a handle to think about uh, what, are, what are the problems that I'm going to run into when I get this into production. And a lot of times, uh, we certainly went through this kind of mindset. It, when you're starting out with a project, it's easy to think about what are these awesome features that I'm building and, and scaling problems and edge cases. We'll just kind of, we'll think about those later, right? That's, a, that's just, that's a good problems to have, right? But I think what we're trying to see is that if we flip that around, those actually become tools for us to find uh, what kind of things we need to pin down. In a talk uh, about three years ago, Rich said that design is making decisions, right? The artifact of the design process is a set of decisions that you deliver. And so decisions about how am I going to deal with this constraint? How am I going to deal with running out of disk space? How am I going to run? How am I going to deal with not being able to connect to this service? Those are the kind of decisions that can uh, give us the Lego blocks we need to build our features. So I said I was going to start out kind of in three phases here, doing it wrong. Uh, so our first phase is just that kind of wishful thinking. Hey, we'll deal with that later when we're wildly successful and we, we can just, we'll have all the knowledge to figure out how to deal with constraints. So let me give you a little setup on our environment. Boston talked some about this. But the way that we get data in is that we get just these big dumps of data. So we're dealing with hundreds of millions of facts coming in that we need to get into Datomic in particular. And they're not spread out over the month or over the week. It's just one day, hey, we're already late on this case. Can you get 100 million facts into the database? Uh, the judge says we have to do it. You know, it's, 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 we're always behind. Uh, but we also run it in an online system that uh, you know, has all the normal characteristics of a web application. So people have to be able to access it and do their work. And as Boston mentioned, we have a lot of variation in cardinality. So if we treat our document kind of as our fundamental unit of work, some documents have one page, and some documents surprisingly have 100,000 pages. Uh, we haven't yet wrapped our mind around how that happens in the world, but uh, we think it has something to do with computers doing crazy stuff. Uh, how you get 100,000 pages out of anything uh, is wild. But, uh, and then finally, we're in this environment where we have all kinds of computing power. Uh, we have a language that makes it really easy to do stuff concurrently, do stuff in parallel. So we have the ability to put lots of things into flight. And on the uh, constraint side of things, uh, I'm going to talk about Datomic. And uh, I've got the picture of the coal miner with a canary up there. Because Datomic has some really cool characteristics because the architecture trade-offs that were made are well documented, and they're also enforced. Uh, Datomic is a system that when you push past its boundaries, it will let you know about it in a, in a way that, that's useful, actually. And so for us, it was very much a canary in the coal mine. Um, and so I've mentioned this already. And one of the main trade-offs that Datomic makes in the architecture is it trades write scalability for uh, asset transactions. So the decision that was made is that, hey, we've got a single thread in a single process. It's going to serialize transactions. And that's how we're going to maintain uh, uh, sequences of consistent database states. 
Um, but you know, it is very much a trade-off. We can't go horizontally wide with right scaling. And this is the question in this example that we failed to ask, because we knew all along that this was something we were probably going to run into. OK, Datomic is a right limited database. We get a whole bunch of data all at once. Uh, it'll probably be OK. You know, <laughs> we'll, we'll figure it out when it gets there. So and again, the important point is that um, Datomic is something that pushed back on us relatively early. But every service has a limitation, because we live in the actual physical world. So any service, even you know, S3 and Amazon, has some kind of limitation. And those are the things that we're going to have to deal with. So how did it work out for us to uh, kind of just use hope as a strategy? Uh, so in the system, a variety of bulk transaction jobs just you know, kind of sprang up here and there doing um, lots of transacting. Some of them try to be good citizens and batch up transactions and do the datomic best practice. Some of them started lots of threads because, hey, maybe that'll be faster. Um, so we've got a lot of different things going on, going into Datomic. And what we didn't provide in terms of a design is a coordination mechanism. So uh, a lot of rights with no way to coordinate those. And what we found was the answer to the question uh, that we did not ask is that um, when you push Datomic past what it can write to its index, it has a couple of watermarks. One is, hey, this is my low watermark. I need to be writing to my durable index. And the high watermark is, hey, you can't do anything else because I'm so far behind on my index. And it will not accept any more transactions. Uh, which, when we first started seeing this, you know, we're running around, oh, Datomic is, is unstable. We gotta, what's going on? And you go look, and there's a happy process sitting there. Resources are fine on the box. There's no errors in the logs. Everything's fine. And you know, we go read the documentation and look at the metrics. And it's like, oh, it turns out it is doing fine. This is what happens when it meets its limit. So we found ourselves uh, in a place that felt very much like playing the whack-a-mole game. Uh, you know, you put some pressure in the system over here. Hey, somebody put a million transactions in. And hey, somebody can't tag from the UI, and, and vice versa. We're just we're kind of running around and trying to figure out how to, to you know, put our finger in the hole in the dike all over the place. Um, and, and the important point of this is that Datomic was doing exactly what it said it would do. Uh, what we were not doing is dealing with what Datomic said it would do. Um, so our, our first reaction to this is to try to figure out, OK, let's stop starting so many threads. Let's batch up things. Let's try to make it better. Um, but we quickly realized that we're going to have to zoom out, right? Back to the Lego analogy, we had not provided what we needed as developers to be successful in getting this data in our system. And it didn't matter how we tuned and tweaked what we had. It just was missing some fundamental pieces. So for uh, the second stage, uh, I'm calling this getting better, uh, using discovered constraints to drive some decisions. And by discovered constraints, I mean stuff that's smacking you in the face, right? Uh, stuff that you're going to have to deal with. So as we went through this process, um, you know, I said design is about making decisions. What are the things that we were having to think about whenever we were trying to get this data into the system? So I'm going to go through a list of those here. We had to think about what, what's the batch size of our transaction and how many threads should be doing that. Um, and that is really about trying to get the transaction to the right length so that people using the system interactively are not waiting for a 10-second transaction. Because if transactions are handled serially, 10 seconds is going to be 10 seconds to everybody who's behind it. We need to, how are we going to handle errors? What if I'm trying to put in a million facts and we get a Dynamo exception? What happens? Where do I put those? What do I do with them? Um, we wanted to be able to annotate transactions with job info. This is one of the, the superpowers of Datomic is that you have reified transactions. Your transactions are actual data. And when we've got millions of facts coming in, we have to break that up over thousands of transactions. If we annotate all those transactions, we can put that job back together and make it into a coherent whole actually existing in the database so that we, if we need to look at the history of jobs, we need to look at how did this document get here? Who did this crazy thing? We can go back and look and say, oh, this job ran, this job ran, this person from the UI uh, added this tag. But this was something that was being 
being re-implemented in a couple different places. And it's, uh, you know, right, it's not something that needs to be reinvented. For long running jobs, we need to track progress, do pause and resume. And really importantly, we need to be able to coordinate back pressure with other jobs. I mean, fundamentally, if you look at the design of Datomic, it's a single pipe. It's a single pipe in a general purpose database, which means if we're going to be successful getting a lot of data in there, we need a single pipe on our side that has our domain modeled in it, right? Uh, Datomic doesn't know about our domain and doesn't know how to do anything other than, hey, let the first guy win. So we needed a place to do things like sharing capacity between jobs and establishing priorities. So this is the kind of stuff, when we step back and look, okay, this is the kind of things not making those decisions forces developers to do every time. And it's just, when I'm writing a job to, you know, draw redactions on documents, this is not the level I want to be thinking at. Am I going to bring down the database or can I draw the pictures? Um, so we needed to, to put those decisions in place. Oh no, I hit it twice. Forget that you saw that bullet. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about um, some of the decisions that came out of looking at that. And the first one is that we need a, a single bulk component. We need to start pulling out a service that would do that stuff for us. And again, this is not a datomic thing. This is all of the services that we use. They all have their own limitations, their own ways that they, they want to be interacted with, um, from Elasticsearch to our natural language processing engine to even things like S3, which is theoretically you can put everything you want there, but it has its own quirks, and we don't want to pass that to developers every single time. We decided that we're going to communicate via queues, and before we had done this in somewhat half-hearted manner, but we decided this is the way we're going to do it because you just kind of get nice out of the box error handling and retry stuff. You get um, a default uh, visualization of your workflow even, you know, seeing where things back up, seeing where you need to scale things. That stuff just kind of comes for free with queues. And you don't have to worry about timing and kind of synchronicity issues because uh, you have things can build up on queues. And if you have a problem, you can deal with it without it becoming a cascading failure kind of scenario. And we're in Amazon, so we have nice queues that let us generate lots of messages without worrying about it. We did go ahead and implement a multiplexer for resource sharing. This turns out to be um, very important all over the place because everything we use is limited, so we need to slice it up between all of the jobs that want access to it, uh, right? This is a fundamental concept, right? This is in your operating system. This is everywhere. Um, but we needed to do it on our side as well. We decided to extract job tracking out of Datomic into its own data store. And um, this is one I don't think we expected, but um, we realized as we looked at this that Datomic is really great for our domain, right? That's where we want to see how documents live, what happens to them, how they got to where they are. But um, the kind of temporary data that documents how a document gets into the system isn't useful. It isn't interesting to the customer. It's just kind of part of our machinery. And it was eating up uh, a significant portion of this limited write capacity we had. So we said, OK, we should stop doing that, because that's just kind of shooting ourselves in the foot. And then also, as we looked at our data patterns, we said, we're not really happy. We're, we're good functional programmers. Like, we like to isolate our uh, side effects but we're writing to the data database all over the place. And so what we wanted to do was say, OK, let's put in uh, tools that let us accumulate data over a process, and then in a very controlled way say, this is where we want to transact, and not you know, dozens of transactions all over the place. So that went into that decision. And we implemented a routing slip pattern to build jobs out of these components. And what this let us do was, uh, make a declarative way, a data-oriented way to say, the, the process of this item getting into the system is this step, this step, this step, and this one. And it just allowed us to break things apart. And one final um, 
it's not even a datomic specific thing, but one of the things we had done was just delegate uh, identity creation to our database, which um, caused some ordering constraints. I mean, we had to go into datomic first, and it also made it uh, difficult to deal with problems like multiple delivery that you have in a distributed queuing system. So we said, actually, you know, we're drawing a line here, and the people on this side who are creating the data need to make some good decisions about what identity is so that we can do upserts and we can do, you know, make, our, make sure our, our operations are repeatable, all that stuff. So I, in the setup, I said, you know, there's kind of two main goals we were trying to get at when we uh, stepped back. And one was to be able to get this data into the system while maintaining uh, the stability and uh, the kind of response times for the interactive users that we want. And the second one is to, is to kind of take it off the developer's plate, right? It's not something I have to invent every time I want to do this. I don't have to you know, get a knot in my stomach when I think about writing a data-oriented job in the system. And so we've been successful in doing that, so that's been really good. We, we don't actually get transactor unavailable exceptions anymore, except when it actually is unavailable, uh, like if Dynamo's out or something. And uh, developers have uh, ported most of our processes um, to this framework. And I want to run over a, a, few of the a few of the payoffs that we had that we didn't quite expect, but which have been really gratifying to me. And the first is that our process became more data oriented. When uh, we broke things into components and we reordered the components, we discovered surprise little decisions made deep down in the components that didn't really have anything to do with the functionality, say, of going into Datomic, but somebody happened to discover a bad data value down there, and so they filtered it out down in that component. And when we reordered things, those rose to the top as bugs because right, the assumptions about uh, what the data looked like no longer held because things were reordered. And so we kind of scratched our heads on that and we realized now that we had this system in place, we could move those decisions back to the beginning of the process. So we read our data in, we parse it, we clean it up, and we, we can design a routing slip that says these are the places it needs to go. It can skip that place because it doesn't have that data. And uh, so that was, that was cool to find out that uh, we could go to a more data-oriented, more simple, right? The components had fewer surprise uh, branches in them. And this point is similar. Uh, if we think about design as breaking things apart, um, with the routing slip, we could skip steps. But we found places where, oh, I can't skip this step because I need one particular branch of an if statement. And that helped us see where we had things like basically uh, two Lego blocks you know, melted together and then we needed to pull those apart so that we could design the processes the way we wanted to. And this is a big one too. I, I keep thinking I'm gonna skip a bullet point here to save time, but this was a, a big thing for us because I, I'm sure everybody in here has accumulated data in your database over the years and your database starts looking like, why is it like that? And you have to explain, well, it, it shouldn't be like that, but there's eight million rows, and so we can't do it. And uh, but putting this in place has allowed us to do things like, to, we've done migrations on hundreds of millions of entities, and we know that we can do that. We know what it's going to look like. We know how we can control the resources and back it off and keep it out of the way of our production data, which is always cool. I feel like we can be better stewards of the data that we have. And then, scaling is a more straightforward uh, story too. Um, and so for my, my third and final quick little section, I'm going to talk about how can we do this better? Because it's very, it's cool. I, I'm, you know, I'm proud of the place that we are in terms of the architecture that we have, but um, it uh, has it felt at times a little bit like this picture that I saw on the internet. When I saw this on the internet, I, I uh, think I cried a little bit because I don't know if you've seen that. Uh, if you, you can watch the video, they get that car up on two wheels and change the tires. Uh, and uh, I actually sent this to our CEO at one point to say, this is how it feels right now. Um, but doing that process of changing your architecture out from underneath while you're trying to maintain a production system, while you're trying to scale it, while you're supporting customers, is to me, it's not the ideal setup. So if we could learn to do this sooner, uh, I think uh, I would have fewer gray hairs. 
Um, so I'm calling getting better earlier, digging for constraints up front. And I mean, the basic idea here is just being realistic and thinking about, I'm writing a feature, and you don't have to read all those points. That's just a list of stuff that can go wrong, right? I think we can probably all come up with lists of stuff that can go wrong pretty fast. Um, and I've also uh, you know, put a picture of the release it book up there. A colleague of ours, Tim Pote, uh, was, has really pushed that on us. And it's a great source of ideas about the kind of things that your app is going to run into that you probably didn't expect uh, when it starts to get under pr traffic pressure. Um, so I'm going to kick it back to Boston, talk about the UI. All right. Um, all right, I'm going to talk about designing the UI and give a little bit of an overview of um, what I will discuss. Basically, our closure script experience, um, the libraries we use, and then design, um, question mark, right? What do we do with the design? How did it work out? What should we have done? What are we going to do? Um, so simply put, we love ClojureScript. Um, we've been using it from the start, and we just love it. We think it's great. So with JavaScript, you have um, things like this and changing uh, different versions of equality, you know, double equals, triple equals, um, namespaces, right? Ver kind of modules. Basically, you end up making modules using closures, right? But uh, all sources of crazy bugs and lots of work, right? And we, there's a whole class of bugs, a whole class of work that we just don't have to think about with ClojureScript. Um, and so I think that is a really, really big win. Um, when we do interrupt with JavaScript, we use some um, JavaScript libraries, uh, PDFJS being um, a big one. Um, interrupt with that is very straightforward, go, flows really well. Um, the main problem being um, we love data, we want data, and we get objects. And so when you interrupt with JavaScript, that's the, the, the main difficulty. But on our side, um, we love it. And FigWill and REPL, uh, FigWill is a tool for uh, hot reloading, and then uh, REPL we all know and love. Um, just what we get with ClojureScript, we love. We're you know, super happy with the decision to use it. Um, a list of some libraries we use. So you know, we have an app in production for three, four years. Um, you end up doing upgrades and overlap, and I have old code that I don't really want to touch or that isn't you know, part of the new feature I'm doing, right? So, so we have some overlap, and um, here's a list of just some of the things um, that we use. And moving forward, what we'd like to be using, um, Core Async, Component, DataScript, and Ohm. So, uh, new features, um, old features that you end up touching again, um, we move to move into um, these new things, right? And um, so just kind of as a walk through, some of the libraries that we've upgraded to are new tools that we've chosen. Um, so what has the experience been like that, uh, doing those, and why do we choose those? Uh, so again, uh, we, we purposely chose ClojureScript um, over JavaScript, and so we never actually made a transition, but that was a specific choice we made. Um, uh, before I actually joined the company, but a choice that was made. Um, and then we're using jQuery and BaconJS, which is a, a FRP, Functional Reactive Programming Library. And we're using that for a UI, and then we switched to using React and Ohm. And this was a, a mostly positive, mostly straightforward um, uh, transition. Uh, Ohm played well um, in being able to just take over this section, this component, and then you have a stream or multiple streams that send its data there, and we're able to do uh, upgrade over a time period as opposed to rewriting everything at once. Um, so um, I was an own fan when I came on and drove, really pushed on this. Um, so we had, you know, FRP, I think is, you know, a lot of people enjoy that, a lot of great for, for me and for, it seemed like most of the team, it didn't fit as well as the way, way we thought, but, um, but overall this was, um, we are net, um, um, marking this as a positive, as something we enjoyed, a, a good change. Um, and then we had our application state. We kept it in a simple map. And then we had some more complicated relationships that we wanted to store in there. And so we moved to DataScript. Um, DataScript is basically Datomic database on the front end uh, or in JavaScript. Um, and um, so we use that, and that we hold our application state in, Datomic, or in DataScript now. Um, and then we had, um, you know, the callback world where, you know, this thing happens and you give it this function. So tell me when it happened by calling this function, right? And we moved to using core async and channels now. So, you know, so callbacks are basically, hey, this thing happened, get the value. Um, you know, you, most time you get an object. So parse out the data you want, make it actual immutable data, and then put it on a channel and you're done. Um, so I think core async is probably my favorite library just because it's just amazing to me that we get that from a library and what it adds and it makes, um, 
uh, asynchronous code looks synchronous and uh, more simple to think through. Um, so these are a few other upgrades we've made, and, um, and I would say all of them have been a positive. All of them have been purposeful choices we've made that have worked out well. Right. So, but when I stop and look at these, and as a team we stop and look at these and start looking at what, what we're getting, what are the bugs that come up, what are the um, features that are still hard, or you know, what am I thinking about, um, we have to ask ourselves, are these useful? Right? So I made all these upgrades, I moved from a map to data script, right? and what do I get out of that? Right? At some point I still have my application state in this atom, basically. Right? And so after all these upgrades, like, we feel like overall, objectively, it's better. Right? We got specifically better performance with, when we moved to, real, uh, to OM uh, versus FRP, and most of that was our fault, but when you look at the code, if that's what you're producing at some point, you, you kind of look at that and say, all right, is that what I want to be doing? Um, so we, we got better performance, um, faster durations, when you just overall simpler code, right? So, so we, we certainly got some benefits, but on one hand, it feels like you get six and you move to half a dozen, right? Because you're kind of doing the same thing, but incrementally getting better. And so we said, we step back and we say, okay, we still have a lot of stuff that's hard to do. Um, what are we missing, right? What is, what is going on? And so kind of continuing it with the theme of what Cable was saying, what are the decisions that are missing? What are the design? What are the things I have to think about continually when I go to code, right? And so here's a big list. None of these are particularly unique to us. Um, and you could come up with your own list, right? Um, and so I'll highlight a few, like partial, partial is still app state, right? So if you're storing all your application state, and someone moves to a different section of the, uh, of, the, of the site of your application. Some of that, or even most of the application state, is still valid, right? It's, it applies to where they're at, and it's up to date. But there's some section of application state that you don't have, right? So you have to go to the server to get it, or that's out of date, right? So what do you do there? Do you display everything and just wait to get the new stuff? Do you just wait until you get all the new stuff? Do you just throw it away, right? And so it's not to say that that's particularly hard, but that's a decision that needs to be made that hasn't been made, right? Or the user's leaving the page and make sure that everything's been saved, right? Okay, maybe not a particularly hard problem, but if you haven't done it, then it just means you have to do it every time on every page, make sure it's done, right? And so these are, when you put these together, you're just like, okay, this is a whole lot of stuff. And at that point, we have to stop because I know my natural tendency, and I feel like the developers in general, we're just like, oh, okay, I remember, you know, communicating novelty and identity. I remember specifically David Nolan talked about that in his Omnext talk, so I'm gonna go Google Omnext and start looking at it and figure it out, oh yeah, we're gonna use Omnext, right? And you're like, no, actually, right? Because that is what I'm calling library-driven development, right? It's the, I have this problem, find the library for it. I have this problem, find the library. And so this is from um, the Practical Dev Twitter, right? And I love this, right, because how many of us know that? Rewriting your front end every six weeks, right? And I love the tagline, right? It's this time you have definitely chosen the right libraries, right? Like I know everyone has been there where they're like, this is the one. This is the library that is going to fix this, right? And then like tomorrow, Hacker News has that new thing that does this whiz bang thing. You're just like, oh yeah, right? And it's like, you know, at some point we want to, we're about to upgrade, start feeling like, what am I doing? This feels like deja vu, like I've been here and I'm gonna be here again, right? Um, because it's not, you know, I feel like this is a lot of the source of the JavaScript fatigue, right? It's because we're turning, we're doing the same thing, we're doing the same thing, in incremental gain, incremental gain, right? And this library isn't really, really solving our problem, right? It's not really solving the hard part of what we're doing, right? And so it's what we love in Clojure, what we want to be doing, design-driven development, and we all love the hammock, right? We praise the hammock, like the hammock, right? And so we want to take more time to sit and design, sit and think, right? Sit and figure out what are the real problems we're, we're needing to solve, right? Um, and then another tool that is perhaps more humble and gets less love is uh, pen and paper. Um, I love this quote, writing is nature's way of letting you know how sloppy your thinking is. Um, I'm lazy, and so I love the hammock. I don't necessarily love the hard part of writing things down and explaining, right? So we use, we try to use writing not simply as a document everything so the next person can read it, but even as a further clarification of our thinking and even a communication with yourself of have I thought this through, what have I missed, um, and then as a way to communicate with others as well, right? So, um, so we want to take a step back and really design things, right? So, so what are some of the decisions we've made? Um, um, number one, the UI is a system 
right? We, it needs to be designed together. It's, it's, no, it's moved from a, you know, just put the designer on it, the person who kind of put the junior developer on it, right? The person who doesn't really know about the design, right? Like, it, it's no longer that, right? Especially for us. And um, this is in process. We're still learning how to do this. We're still in the process of actually um, figuring out the entire design. And then libraries don't define the system. Um, just a set of incrementally improving your libraries does not give you a system, does not give you um, things that work well together, right? And we've been afraid to spend a lot of design time on the front end because like, oh, there's so much churn, things are changing all the time. We don't want to spend a bunch of design because it's just going to change, right? And I feel like that's actually kind of backwards, right? Is that everything changes all the time because we don't design, right? It's like, oh, I didn't think about this thing, so let me go get this new thing, right? And it's like, so if we spend more to more design time up front, we spend less time on the churn. And the upgrade of the library becomes simpler because you know where it fits and all the seams and all the way it connects. Um, and so again, we're in the middle of this, um, so I don't want to make it sound like we have all the answers. I haven't figured it out. Um, but is it working? Um, our company is doing, doing well. I mean, we're still startup piece stage, kind of moving out of that. Um, but um, we've had real success of customers that can't get their data in another system because it's you know two million documents and it crashes their system. They can't use it. Um, and basically, in that case, what happens is the case is dropped, right? I, we can't make money off this because we can't do our job, we can't software, so just drop the case, we're not gonna take it. And so we had a case where it was about to be dropped and they try our system and they literally brought everyone into the conference room and showed the software running their system because they were just like in awe that the system can actually handle it, right? And so our, our system worked great and you know, again, there's bugs and there's stuff. We're not, we're not perfect, but, um, but things are working really well and we are growing as developers of, you know, I said earlier at lunch, I feel like I've grown more in the past year than I have, you know, maybe in you know, five years before that. Just, um, being in the Clojure community, um, doing things like this, and the way Clojure pushes us um, to, to learn new things, right? So a few of our influences, um, when the video is made public, you can kind of Google these. These are really great talks. One thing I want to point out, Ohm Next seems like almost contradictory, because I just said it's not about libraries, and I put Ohm Next. One of the things I love about that talk is how David enumerates the problems he's trying to solve, right? And that's part of the design I'm talking about, right? When you look at that talk, he talks about, hey, this problem, this problem, this problem, this problem. It's not this feature, so I did this, and this feature, so I did this, right? And it, it's an actual design. So this talk could kind of be summed up in learning to practice what we preach. Like, we love simplicity, talk about cues, data, immutability, right? Um, we love those things, and I, and I hope most of us aren't just giving them lip service, but there is a process of learning what that means, right? What does it mean for a code to be simple, right? And then what does it mean, not just for this function to be simple, but for this namespace? And then what does this module and what does this system as a whole look like, right? So learning those things um, is a process and one that we've been um, on and continue to be on and, and hopefully um, stay on for a while. Um, so with that, um, we just say thanks and we'll open up for questions. Um, we'll take a few questions, just maybe one, or if someone has one, one. I've been given a signal one. Anybody have a quick question? All right, we'll be around. We, uh, we would love to talk to you if you're shy, like he seems to be or something. So I'm just kidding. But um, anyways, thanks for your time. We appreciate it.